Okay, and uh, my name is Kei Sakamoto. I'm group leader and then also a vice director, vice executive director of CBA Mao. So it is my great and real pleasure to introduce our next and final speaker of uh, Metaphysics Day, which is who is the Professor uh, Basmi uh, Musa. So that um, he is currently a uh, investigator of Harvard Hughes Medical Institute and the professor of System Biology and Medicine at Harvard Medical School and also Mass General Hospital. And then he's also a member of Broad Institute of MIT and Harvard. And so he has fascinating training record that uh, he received his bachelor degrees in mathematical sciences and also computational sciences from Stanford University. And then he did actually medical degree um, from uh, the Harvard, uh, uh, Harvard University. And this was a joint actually program between MIT and Harvard, so that he had also opportunity to do uh, mitochondrial research at the P uh, his thesis. And then actually he did actually medical training at Brigham and Women's Hospital. And then he decided to actually do the postdoc with Eric Landa at MIT White you know, Head Institute. So that's fascinatingly that uh, he invented uh, gene, gene set enrichment analysis platform uh, when he was a postdoc. So, you know, this was a major, actually, uh, the software that's now everybody uses. But at that point, you know, there are only four micro data you know, out there. And then this was a, you know, instrumental tool for everybody to do express analysis. And then he joined as a faculty of Harvard University in 2004. And then also you know, he mentioned that he actually came to Copenhagen for a year to work with Matthias Mann for protein research. Uh, maybe this inspired his you know, insight in terms of protein aspects of mitochondrial research. So uh, the, uh, he's actually, you know, he research is designated pretty much to a uh, full spectrum of mitochondrial biology from discovery of genes of mitochondrial disease to neuro neurological disorders uh, to mechanistic insight into functionality of mitochondria and then actually working with clinicians to actually uh, develop potential new therapeutics uh, for treating such disease. But really fascinating aspects of, you know, actually, Basmi is that he develops novel, unique, you know, tools and then also resources and that actually really facilitates, you know, unexpected novel discovery. And this is what he's going to talk about. And that's what he's going to talk about, the genomic approaches to mitochondrial biology and diseases. So stage is yours. Please welcome, that's me. Thank you very much, uh, Julien, for the very, very kind invitation to come to CBMR. And also, Kay, thank you for the very kind uh, introduction. I'm, I'm impressed that you uh, memorized so much of my <laughs> biography as well. It's quite impressive. Um, it's a real, real pleasure to be returning back to uh, Denmark. As Kay said, probably about 23, maybe 24 years ago or so, I came and I spent uh, about eight months or so in Odense. I wasn't actually in Copenhagen, I was actually in Odense. And uh, that's actually where I trained a little bit with Matthias Mann and his company at that time in mass spec proteomics. Uh, and so it's great to be back. And today I am going to be talking about mitochondria. There's going to be a very heavy focus on oxygen, oxygen metabolism and oxygen physiology. And I want to just begin by saying that I, I would be totally remiss to be coming to University of Copenhagen and not pay my obeisances to three really important figures. There's at least three important figures in the history of oxygen biochemistry, oxygen physiology. I think many people here probably are familiar with August Crow, a Nobel laureate who actually got the Nobel Prize for understanding the unique role of capillaries in blood flow delivery, in particular oxygen delivery. And he's also very important for the Novo Nordisk Foundation because he had visited the United States and then when he came back to uh, Denmark, he actually brought back uh, insulin. And so in many ways, he actually helped to, if I'm not mistaken, he was even one of the founders of the original company, but that's, that's only August Crow. And then of course, his mentor is Christian Bohr, uh, and I think everybody in the world knows who Niels Bohr is, but his father was a very famous physician, of course, at this hospital. And uh, we all learned the Bohr effect, the ability of pH to impact uh, the binding of oxygen to hemoglobin. Uh, and so that's yet another landmark figure in oxygen physiology. And then perhaps less well uh, appreciated is uh, somebody named Hermann Kalker. I feel a kindred spirit to him because he's from here, he trained here, but he actually ended up moving to Massachusetts and actually ended up in my 
hospital at Mass General Hospital. And uh, many people are familiar with oxidative phosphorylation. Nobel Prizes were even given uh, to Peter Mitchell uh, for helping to elucidate the mechanism uh, by which uh, energy transformations are coupled. But at some point, somebody had made the important observation that oxidation is coupled to phosphorylation. And that was really a lot of the work from Herman uh, Kalker. And so there's so much rich history over here, so it's wonderful for me to be here. And uh, I'm going to be talking about oxygen, but I'm really standing on the shoulders of some of the giants uh, that were here at Copenhagen before. So uh, my entire, as Kay said, my entire laboratory focuses on mitochondrial biology. Half of the group is focused on basic aspects of the organelle. Uh, when you look at these organelles, they're absolutely gorgeous. That's what first got me addicted to them a little bit more than 29 years ago when I was a medical student. And they look like bacteria because, of course, one and a half billion years ago, they're free-swimming bacteria, probably related to modern-day gram-negative rods. They're called the powerhouse of the cell because they have this beautiful machinery, this oxidative phosphorylation machinery, that's consuming almost all of the oxygen that we're breathing right now and helping to efficiently make ATP. And they retain a vestige of their bacterial ancestry. They have a tiny little genome, the mitochondrial DNA, which is maternally transmitted. Uh, and it encodes 13 proteins that are important for oxidative phosphorylation. So half of our lab is squarely focused on the biochemistry and evolution of this organelle. The other half of our lab is very interested in what happens to mitochondria when they break down. What happens to us when our mitochondria break down? And as it turns out, this organelle is slowly going to break down in every single one of us. As all of us age, the number of mitochondria declines and the activity of uh, mitochondria declines. That's the bad news. The good news is some mix of uh, aerobic exercise and weight training can send you back up north on a trajectory, but this is a little bit inevitable, unfortunately. And of course, the billion-dollar question in the aging field is cause and effect. Does the decline in mitochondrial activity drive uh, the aging process, or when we age, do we have sick tissue, so we have sick mitochondria? That's sort of the billion-dollar question in the aging field. And the opposite end of the extreme uh, are a very large number of ultra-rare, typically monogenic disorders, uh, such as Lee syndrome. And these disorders, there's a little doubt that the birth defect in the mitochondrion is causal for the pathology. And so we have historically focused on these rare diseases, in part because there's uh, really no effective therapies that are available for them. Uh, and number two, we strongly believe by investigating them, we're going to understand a lot of basic biology that could then be extended to some of these more common conditions. So today, I'm going to be focusing on, on some of the more rare, and at the very end, we'll try to circle back in a fun, uh, provocative way about the common. So let me just introduce these rare disorders because uh, I'm going to be focusing on them today. Uh, when, when, when I'm talking about a mitochondrial disorder uh, today, I'm talking typically about a disorder that impacts the oxidative phosphorylation system. This can be encoded by both mtDNA subunits and by nuclear subunits. So they can show maternal uh, patterns of transmission or Mendelian. Uh, there's a lot of phenotypic heterogeneity. I mean, some of these patients, uh, surprisingly, will only have eye disease because of mutations in a subunit over here, yet other patients will have everything that's shown over here because of a mutation in a subunit right there. And so even though uh, this complex one, as an example, simply transfers two electrons from NADH to Q while pumping protons, different mutations of the same complex can lead to extremely different phenotypes. And we do not, this is a real systems biology problem. We do not understand what gives rise to this phenotypic heterogeneity. Now, one thing I want to emphasize is that there's very, very limited uh, therapies for these disorders. So uh, I want to just introduce my laboratory. The key questions of our laboratory from the day that we started it to 18 years later today is number one, we want to understand the full functional circuitry of mitochondria. Number two, we want to understand the, the genetic and the biochemical basis of uh, mitochondrial disorders. And then finally, we want to come up with new ways of alleviating these disorders. So 
that mitochondrial genome was actually sequenced uh, in 1981. This was actually one of the real landmarks in the history of mitochondrial biology. And this was really led by Fred Sanger. He had won the Nobel Prize just uh, a few months earlier, uh, but even in his Nobel lecture, he actually wrote quite a bit about what we had learned, what he had learned by sequencing uh, uh, multiple genomes, including the human genome. And, his uh, author list was uh, listed alphabetically, but if you even look at the author list, you'll see some of the early bioinformaticians uh, as well. So it's this beautiful, beautiful uh, paper. But, uh, and after that, much of the field of mitochondrial disease biology was focused on this genome as the source of disease. But we knew from Fred's paper, as well as from companion papers on the same issue of nature, that this genome only encoded 13 proteins total. Yet, when I was going through medical training, and even today, if you're a medical student or um, uh, taking your board exams, the answer to every single question about mitochondrial disease is maternal transmission. Right? It's maternally inherited. But that thing is only encoding 13 proteins total, so something else must be coming from the nuclear genome as well. And I was finishing my clinical training in 2001, and that's right when the human genome sequence was also coming online. And so I had a bit of a math background, as Kay said earlier, so I wanted to use my computational background to, to investigate the nuclear genome to see how it contributes to this organelle. And uh, I did some initial training in the year 2000 and 2001 with Matthias Mann to pick up a little bit of mass spec proteomics, and then I did my three-year postdoc with Eric Lander uh, at the Whitehead Institute. And I went there uh, uh, with the goal of picking up some computational genomics methods. Uh, but as soon as I got there, uh, somebody named John Ryu, who was a research fellow at that time, uh, approached me at a Whitehead retreat and told me about a disease that he was working on on the side. So those of you that know John Ryu, you know that his real passion is inflammatory bowel disease. But he actually comes from the saguenay lac saint John region of French Quebec. And he's actually working on a disease that at that time was the most common recessive disease. This is called Lee syndrome, French Canadian variant. It was described only about a decade prior to when I was doing my postdoc. And uh, it's a recessive disease uh, characterized by really bad uh, metabolic pathology in the liver, as well as in the brain, something called Lee syndrome, which I'll talk about a little bit later. And uh, this is a pretty devastating disease. Most of these kids were being born and then died within the first few months or years of life. Now, before I even got to uh, the Whitehead, uh, John Ryu had led um, basically a GWAS study. And so this was, they called it, this was before the name GWAS even was coined, but basically it was a genome-wide association study where they're basically looking for LD blocks that were a product of the uh, French Quebec um, haplotype that were associated with the disease. Uh, and uh, this very early application of GWAS uh, led to the identification of a region of a chromosome, on chromosome 2, that must harbor the disease gene. But because of the limited number of recombinations that were observable uh, at that time, they were stuck with the region of the genome. And John Ryu asked me after this paper was published, can you help us find the disease gene? And this was super, super fun. Uh, uh, everything about this disease, based on the biochemistry, we knew that it had to be a mitochondrial disease. Uh, there's about 30 or so known and predicted genes in that particular interval. So the question is, which of these could plausibly be mutated to cause a mito disease? And it was super fun. We had the genetic interval. I generated some mass spec data with Matthias Mann and Odensa. Uh, I basically mapped that back into that particular region of the genome to see where the peptides piled up. In this case, said back then, there was literally four microarray data sets in the public domain. So we came up with a a metric of co-expression with the known mitochondrial genes, so we could score all genes in the genome for their expression similarity to the known mitogenes. When you triangulate, that led to exactly one gene, LRPPRC, ended up having the mutation. Uh, we also fortunately found a compound heterozygote, so we found mutations on two independent haplotypes. We'd found the disease gene. And at that time, you know, this is, uh, it was a relatively big deal. This is an important disease in that particular community. Uh, we also coined the term integrative genomics. I think nowadays we call this multi-omics, but at that time, this was sort of an early uh, implementation of this particular approach. And I love this photo because this is actually gifted to us by a mother who had actually lost two kids uh, to this particular disease. And uh, her husband was one of the world's leading triathletes 
and was basically raising money to help find the disease gene. So John Ryu had received about $50,000 to do the research to help find the disease gene. And then once the disease gene was identified, she did this painting and then she sent it to us. So it still hangs in our lab today as a reminder of uh, why we do the work that we do. So um, that was then, this was in 2001. And since then, once I set up my own laboratory, a big part was to figure out what are all the nuclear genes that encode proteins that end up in this compartment. And so over the years, we've come out with an inventory called Mitocarda, Mitocarda 2.0. And then during the pandemic, we released Mitocarda 3.0. This is a freely available atlas. So in addition to those 13 proteins coming from the nuclear, uh, from the mitochondrial genome, there's about 1,100 proteins that come from the nuclear genome. And now this serves as a platform for both basic science studies as well as for uh, 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 for basic and for translational research. Uh, now, if you fast forward in 2023, there are now more than 300 monogenic mitochondrial diseases. Uh, and again, most of these are obviously nuclear uh, in, in origin. Most of them are recessive. Uh, and, you know, one of the real challenge th challenges of these disorders is that they're not just rare, they are ultra rare. There's this extremely long tail of, 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 of genes where they impact maybe tens, hundreds uh, of individuals only. And biotech will only really get interested in a particular disease if there's at least a thousand patients to treat. Not theoretical, but they need to be able to identify a thousand patients that they can treat. So mo for most of these, we're well south of that particular uh, threshold. Uh, and so the gen understanding the genetics of these disorders has become much more straightforward from whole genome sequencing. You triangulate on mitocarda, you can typically identify the disease genes. And now uh, we've converted those mass specs from doing proteomics to metabolomics because what we really want to know now are some of the biomarkers. The first time that the patient comes to you, they're going to ask you, what's my diagnosis? The next time, once you've given them a genetic diagnosis, they want to know, Am I getting better? Am I going, getting worse? You put me on an experimental therapy. What's happening? And so we've been doing metabolomics on genetically monomorphic forms of these disorders, so small cohorts in French Quebec. We have a MILOS cohort. We've had about three or four of these cohorts. And the reason biomarkers are so, so important is, is not for diagnosis, but for monitoring disease progression, for quantifying therapeutic response, also in an era of precision medicine, because these are also ultra rare, we want to be able to group some of these ultra rare diseases together based on the biochemistry, and then maybe offer each one you know, a precision uh, approach. So we've been doing a lot of metabolomics. I'm just going to summarize all of this uh, based on uh, three different studies focused on three genetic forms of mitochondrial disease where the respiratory chain is broken. If I summarize all of it, you know, we've identified about 19 metabolites uh, total. Uh, most all of them uh, th that distinguish patients from controls and almost all of that signature, that main principal component corresponds to a high NADH, NAD ratio. So we call this reductive stress. There's too many reducing equivalents because those usually get burned by the electron transport chain. So things like lactate, alpha hydroxybutyrate, as well as lactoal amino acids. This is a lactate that is covalently attached to an amino acid. These are all accumulating in these patients. We also see uh, very strong signs of the integrated stress response. GDF15 is a very strong protein marker, and it's now known that the ISR uh, seems to uh, light up uh, in response to mito dysfunction. And what's really neat about this panel is that it also correlates with uh, markers of disease severity. So there's something called a Karnofsky score. This is uh, often used to sort of rate how sick a particular patient is. And these markers are also markers of disease severity as well. So we're now trying to do prospective studies to see how these markers change as a function of time. So this is our uh, vision right now. Our vision is that when we have a patient with mito disease from a single tube of blood, we ought to be able to establish a genetic diagnosis and then we also ought to be able to stage that patient biochemically. Uh, and now when we offer a novel therapy, we want to monitor those biochemicals to see if they're getting better or worse. So the only thing that's missing right now for this is a therapy. And in the time that remains, what I want to do is I want to share with you an exciting strategy that, that, that we, we think one day may help a lot of these patients. So in 2016, uh, we did a, a CRISPR screen and uh, we made this really, really, I think really, really interesting observation uh, that at least in cell culture, uh, activation of the hypoxia response. So hypoxia could actually buffer 
mitochondrial dysfunction. Uh, it was totally unexpected because until then, there were some physicians even that were treating their patients with high oxygen. Like, your kid doesn't have enough energy, let's give more oxygen. Our screen taught us the exact opposite, that low O2 would be good. And uh, we did a lot of stuff in cell culture, and then we decided to graduate to a mouse model, and we ended up working on a mouse model of Lee syndrome. So this is that disease that I told you about earlier. This is the most common pediatric manifestation of mitochondrial disease. It's characterized by a subacute degeneration of either the brainstem, the basal ganglia, the spinal cords. Uh, we can diagnose it based on the clinical picture as well as based on MRI. Uh, there's more than 80 monogenic forms of Lee syndrome, not a single proven therapy as of today. More than 10 years ago, Richard Palmiter's group knocked out one of those nuclear subunits of the respiratory chain uh, and created a mouse model of Lee syndrome. It's a very, very faithful model. It's like the human that has the same deficiency. They're born okay, developmentally okay. Uh, and then these mice, right around day 55 or so, they become extremely, extremely sick. Uh, and they also develop lesions as well uh, that you can see on MRI. And so we got this mouse, and uh, now we have this... Uh, idea that low oxygen might be beneficial. And so um, these are five mice that have NFS4 deficiency. Uh, two of them have been living at the equivalent, not Mount Everest, but they've been living at the equivalent of Mont Blanc, right, which is uh, about 15,000 feet or 11% oxygen. So healthy humans should be able to tolerate 11% O2. Again, this is about day 55, so the mice should be extremely sick, but two of them have been breathing thin air. Right? So see if you can guess which two are breathing thin air. hope it's not subtle. It's not subtle at all. It's a very dramatic effect. There's the two mice that are trying to jump out of the cage are the ones that have been breathing thin air. These mice ordinarily die at 55 days of age from their neurological disease. If they've been breathing 11% oxygen since the time of weaning, this is a survival curve. And we stopped this for publication. S subsequent to publication, we carried out the survival curve. They, it's not perfect, they survive to be about 350 days. A mouse should survive to about two years of age, but they're surviving almost to one year of age. Okay. So a dramatic increase in lifespan. In addition, uh, health span also, they're putting on body weight. Um, uh, these markers that we've identified, like alpha hydroxybutyrate, lactate, of course, they're elevated in the mouse model. When they're in hypoxia, there's a biomarker response. And those lesions that I showed you on MRI, this is what they look like. Um, uh, on histopathology, a massive amount of neuroinflammation. It does not appear when the mice are in low O2. So it's a dramatic, dramatic improvement. And so uh, we had approached Warren Zapal, one of my colleagues at MGH, because he had hypoxia chambers, uh, and uh, he was able to help us do these experiments. And so we're all stunned by the results. He actually came back to me and then said, hey, if low oxygen is good, what happens with high oxygen? So then we decided to dial up the oxygen to 55%. So that's an O2 level that all healthy humans ought to be able to tolerate. And if ever you have surgery, for example, you may be exposed to 55% FiO2. But this is what happens to these mice. They will die within about two to three days of exposure to 55% FiO2. After we published this, I received phone calls from around the country uh, from other clinicians that were caring for patients with mitochondrial disease uh, whose outpatients had been placed in what's called hyperbaric oxygen. So recall, oxygen is not particularly soluble in water. Uh, one way of really flooding the system with oxygen is hyperbaria, hyperbaric oxygen. So one doctor, in, uh, one doctor in San Diego told me about two outpatients, two outpatients that were placed in hyperbaric oxygen, became comatose and died within 24 hours. And another doctor told me about two patients with Leber's hereditary optic neuropathy that were already blind in one eye. Statistically, they're going to go blind in the other eye within the next couple of months. Two individuals that went blind in the good eye within one week of HBOT therapy. We had another case like this at MGH uh, uh, in, in, in the mid-2000s uh, as well. And so I think these are all anecdotes, but these anecdotes com combined with our mouse data strongly suggest that when the respiratory chain is broken, high oxygen can be very, very detrimental. 
So what I've shown you so far involves chronic continuous hypoxia. So that's the equivalent of living in a bubble permanently. So that's not so practical. So obviously we want to try to move this in a translational way, in a way that's safe and practical. Now we've hit some hurdles over here. This is not easy. So we've tried intermittent. So wouldn't it be nice if we could live in O2 at nighttime and then run around outside in the daytime? That does not work. And, and it's in part because of what we heard about earlier. When you're in low O2, you're gonna get a polycythemic response. So now when you go back into normoxia, you're gonna be you're gonna be exposed to a lot of oxygen. And so it's almost like a Every 24 hours, it's uh, a burst of hyperoxia, actually. So intermittent does not work. Um, how about Denver, Colorado? So instead of uh, 15,000 feet, uh, how about uh, you know, uh, six, 7,000 feet? Uh, that does not work. We really have to go down to 11%. And uh, there's now drugs that allow you to activate the hypoxia response, HIF activators. That works fine in cell culture. It does not work in vivo, again, because you get this polycythemic response, high oxygen. And so we have to take physiology into consideration also. So there's limitations to this uh, approach at this point. I didn't uh, show you the data, but the, the mice are dying at one year of age. That's because of their cardiac disease. That's not getting fixed by the hypoxia. And we don't fully know why. Uh, so there's some real limitations uh, to this right now. Another important question is, can we reverse any of this disease? Most of these kids will have some sort of a neurometabolic crisis, appear to the emergency room, at which point they'll have T2 intense lesions on their MRI already. So the question is, is any of this reversible? Now these mice have an extremely stereotyped disease trajectory. Uh, they wean fine, and then right around day 55, they're very sick. They're gonna fulfill our hospital's euthanasia criteria in the next few days. So we can take these mice to the brink of death, and then we can start the hypoxia, and this is what we see. We can actually reverse this disease. And if you do MRIs in the same mouse, we can actually make these MRI lesions disappear after about three weeks of hypoxia therapy. And so we think that there's a component of the neurodegeneration that can actually be reversed. We don't think there's frank, outright, complete loss of neurons at this point, but there's severe neuro neurological dysfunction that's reversible. So this is our current working model. We think when most people think about mitochondria, they think powerhouse of the cell, it makes ATP, but it also consumes oxygen. So we think that when the mitochondrion is broken, there's high unused oxygen. And in fact, our patients with mito disease have what's called venous hyperoxia. They're not extracting oxygen in the periphery, so you see a lot of it on the venous side. So we think that when the mitochondrion is broken, oxygen accumulates, it's dioxygen, and that can then do, that can cause bad signaling, and it can also be directly toxic to things like iron sulfur clusters. We've done a lot of work subsequent to this first paper that shows that iron sulfurs are really, really sensitive targets, and so we think there's direct oxidation that's happening in response to this high unused oxygen. Now, if this model is correct, we ought to be able to target the oxygen in other ways and see salutary effects. Uh, and first of all, we did direct measurements, and so uh, we're working with Fumito Ichinosa's laboratory. What he's able to do is place brain uh, oxygen probes, uh, and we see a high partial pressure of oxygen in these mice. We're interpreting that high O2 in these knockout mice as high unused oxygen. And when we place the mice at 11%, we can normalize that. Now, how about if we target this O2 in other ways? What we can do is we can actually give carbon monoxide which is gonna cause the hemoglobin to hold on to that oxygen. It's not gonna release it. It's gonna cause tissue hypoxia. And if we start the carbon monoxide again, when the mice are really sick, we can reverse the disease. We can also give severe, severe anemia to these mice as well. It's not as good as hypoxia, but it's good enough to provide proof of concept. And so some people have said that Vumsi wants to move from molecular to medieval medicine because I'm suggesting, I'm not suggesting carbon monoxide and bleeding, but we're using them as uh, proofs of concept. So this is our key discovery. We found that hypoxia is a natural suppressor of mitochondrial dysfunction, and conversely, high oxygen is toxic in the context of mito dysfunction. And uh, a lot of the ongoing work in the laboratory now is focused on what is the uh, core mechanism, both at a cellular as well as at a whole organism level. Will this generalize beyond Lee syndrome? Uh, and can we translate this in a safe, effective, and practical way into humans? Um, I see that Kay is standing, which means time is almost up, so I'm gonna 
kind of speed up just through a few little um, uh, highlights uh, uh, before I take uh, questions. But this is, uh, this is something that actually is evolutionarily conserved. We're working with Gary Rubkin, who's in my department. He's a very, very good worm geneticist. What's really cool is if you take electron transfer chain mutants and worms, and you expose them to high oxygen, you can fry them, and this is what you want for a genetic screen. So we're now doing forward mutagenesis. And we're identifying the genetic pathways that link mito dysfunction to oxygen toxicity. And um, we've done some CRISPR screens just to find out what genes, when knocked out, uh, lead to a phenotype that can be rescued by low O2. So these are like temperature sensitive mutants, but we've now identified 200 genes. When you knock them out, you get a fitness defect at 21% O2 that you can rescue with low oxygen. So these are candidates for hypoxia therapy, including 76 Mendelian disease genes. And one that we're very excited about is uh, the gene frataxin. This is a gene that is mutated in a recessive ataxia. It's the most common autosomal recessive ataxia. Uh, this is a relatively common mito disease. It was like the tall spike in that histogram that I showed. Uh, impacts about one in 50,000 people. And this is due to a defect in iron sulfur cluster biosynthesis. And uh, prior to our work, nobody's ever made a true, true knockout of frataxin. In, uh, uh, in, in model systems, what we're able to do is by dialing down the oxygen, we can make true knockouts in cells that will continue to proliferate. We can make yeast that are true knockouts of frataxin and they'll continue to form colonies. And Gary's lab is able to knock out, not knock down, knock out frataxin. Not only are those worms alive, but they complete their reproductive life cycle as well. And this is an exciting disease for us because, again, there aren't any really good, good therapies. Uh, and there's enough of them as well so that one could imagine, once we have some sort of a more practical way of, of implementing hypoxia therapy, this may be a good um, set of uh, a disease to go after. So overall, our working model is that uh, uh, there's processes such as iron sulfur clusters that are very oxygen labile. Uh, we think that with low O2, we promote the synthesis of iron sulfurs and we prevent their degradation uh, as well. Um, and so in closing, when we think about human disease, we think about the cross product between genes and environment. And when it comes to mitochondria, they have a really strange genetics. There's two different genomes that have to interact with each other. That's already strange, but we think the very relevant environmental variable is oxygen. And this may be really important because Earth's oxygen has changed a lot over the last few billion years, which you think that in addition to the power advantage, another advantage of endosymbiosis was the ability of the organelle to suck the oxygen out and detoxify it. So that may be another reason there's a selection for endosymbiosis. Um, my colleague Lorenzo Berra has recently completed a phase one safety study of hospitalized hypoxia, which is bringing in some healthy volunteers, keeping them in for about eight or nine days or so so that we get some experience in healthy individuals. We're trying to do some physiology of low O2 in humans. Uh, hopefully the knowledge that we're gaining will help us translate some of these ideas into patients one day. And I want to end with this, this last slide, my final slide. And uh, the question is whether anything that I've shown you today bears any relevance to more common conditions. And this is a paper that, it, it, you know, it, it, it is a paper. Um, and it's been cited maybe 50 or 60 times. But uh, this is a really, really interesting paper that was actually published by the Indian Army. And so the 1960s, there were some border disputes between India and China. And so the Indian Army deployed more than 100,000 troops at the Indochina border. Now, about 10,000 of these troops were living at 10% O2. They were living like way up there in the Himalayas. At, at the equivalent of not 11, but 10% O2. All the others were living at the plains. And then the Indian uh, health services, they basically monitored what was happening to these soldiers at high or low altitude over a seven year period. And the paper is fascinating to read. I mean, they're not, they, they state that they're not in the business of writing health outcome studies, but they made some interesting observations that they felt compelled to, to report. And what's amazing is that the incidence of diabetes, hypertension, ischemic heart disease, all were much, much lower at high altitude. And of course, the temperature is different, the food is different, the clothing is different, UV is different, activity is different, but 
O2 is one of the things that's different. And so it's very tempting to speculate that if oxygen is the reason this is happening, maybe what we're learning from the rare could one day extend to the common as well. Uh, I want to end by thanking the folks that did the work. Uh, Isha Jane was a graduate student that did that initial CRISPR screen that gave rise to this idea uh, and did the initial uh, NDFS4 work. Slil Ast and Josh Mizell were the postdocs that have taken this idea into the uh, protaxin uh, biology as well. They're aided by a number of other members of our laboratory. We have benefited from a number of wonderful collaborators uh, in Boston and elsewhere, uh, and I'm really grateful to the funding agency. And I just want to show a picture of our lab. This is from the pandemic. I love my group. It's an amazingly talented group of individuals. We need to come up with an updated photograph to reflect <laughs> the completion of the pandemic. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Francis. That was a beautiful lecture. Uh, question, so microphone, please. One there and one there, yeah. Hi, Philip Caldas from Lund University. Very beautiful talk. I, I was wondering if you try to treat your mice with um, n acetyl cysteine or glutathione. Yeah, we haven't, but there's some clinicians that actually will treat their Lee syndrome patients with a combination of prednisone and n acetyl cysteine. Uh, we have not done that for our, our mice, though. Maybe you should look at the father who you said was a triathlete. Um, he must be very good in uh, uh, oxygenation to his muscle. I <clears throat> once learned that the West Africans that always win the Olympic Games in sprint, which is very opposite, of course, they are not good in uh, having low uh, oxygen tension. They're not good in going up heights. Just the opposite for both. So maybe the father's genetic could tell you something. Interesting. John Hennison, CBMR. Um, so I might have missed it, but just to confirm, w when you treat with hypoxia, you get lower uh, mitochondrial function. You see reduced oxidative phosphorylation. And, and did you look at like mitochondrial active oxygen species? Because that, that would seem logical, right? You know, you're, you're limiting the, the, the availability of oxygen. So you're just getting lower mitochondrial function. Um, potentially with dysfunctional mitochondria, you're getting less mitochondrial ROS production. Is, is, is that something you looked at? Does that fit within your hypothesis at all? Or? Yeah, so um, I, I think our, our current working model is that when the mitochondrial electron transformation is broken, there's less O2 consumption, so there's an accumulation of oxygen. It's dioxygen, so we're not in the triplet state. We're not actually invoking uh, necessarily superoxide or H2O2, but just dioxygen in the triplet state. And that's able to uh, just directly oxidize uh, iron sulfurs, for example. Now, you'll produce a superoxide as epiphenomenon, but the problem is that you've damaged an iron sulfur cluster. So we think that's what the damage is. Even if you brush away the, the superoxide, the damage is to the thing that's been oxidized. So it's a different way of thinking about oxygen toxicity. Okay. Yep, there yeah. and then. So I'm Shamir, um, bachelor student, really nice talk. Uh, you have mentioned initially that exercise training is like really affects uh, positively uh, to metabolic health through increased mitochondrial oxidative capacity. Um, but what if you do exercise training excessively? Uh, how does this affect your mitochondrial activity? And uh, of course, we know that there are like total of 37 genes in mitochondria. So how does this affect in terms of epigenetics and if there are any disorders related to it? Yeah, you know, I, I am not at all an expert in exercise physiology. Exercise does so many things, including uh, boost the number of mitochondria, but whether that is actually responsible for the salutary effects of exercise or if that's just epiphenomenon, I, I don't know. And there's probably other experts here that you should talk to at the break. Hi, Mordendahl, CBM. Uh, first of all, great talk. This was really fascinating. Um, did I understand correctly that uh, intermittent hypoxia did not work in your mouse model? Did you test how much normal uh, oxygen they could be exposed to while still getting some effect? And, and was the effect um, gradual or was it an all or nothing yeah. uh, effect? No, great question. So intermittent does not work. So we tried like um, uh, 16 and 8 or 8 and 16. Uh, hours, uh, and neither one of those works at all. 
Uh, and then if you try 17% and 14%, you get a little bit, you'll delay the pathology, but it's not nearly as strong as 11%. With 11%, we can even reverse the disease. We get a little bit of a, uh, a boost with 14% uh, and not much with 17%. So it, it needs to be, uh, 11 seems to be a special number. Thank you. Okay, so it and then. So Bamsi, that was super exciting, fantastic. I, I have a couple of questions about the the sort of twin arms of the pathology. So the hyperoxygenation and then the NADH NAD ratio. I thought it was really interesting that the hypoxia appears to affect markers of of both. Yeah. And yeah. Um, yeah. and I'm just curious to hear your thoughts about one how you think that's ha how you think that's happening, and then also, um, do you think that there is a component to, could, could you manipulate the NADH and ID ratio and presumably rescue pathology as well? Um, yeah, no, great, great questions. The, the short answer is we do not know. And you're exactly right. When, when the electron transfer chain is broken, the electron transfer chain, what it's doing is it's basically con transferring four electrons from two molecules of NADH onto oxygen to make it into water, right? So when it's broken, there's high NADH, NAD, and that's what the biomarker is pointing to. And those patients also have high O2 as well. And so, um, with hypoxia, we're directly hitting the uh, O2. And you're probably familiar with the LB-NOx technology that right. we've developed. Yeah. And so we've made those mice now. That this is an enzyme that will chew up the NADH to NAD. We've made the enzyme in worms uh, preliminary. That does not appear to, to be salutary. It's, it doesn't even come close to this. And so, um, so great question. We don't fully know why that biomarker is also getting better with the low O2 also. Hi, over here. Previously, acute myocardial infarction was treated with oxygen. And recent guidelines, they, they, they reported that there's no evidence about it. So my question is, do you think there's anything from mitochondrial function that may explain this to some extent? Yeah, no, thank you uh, very much. I mean, you know, when we think beyond rare mitochondrial disease, the question is whether, uh, I mean, without a doubt in the rare disease community, my, my community has taken notice to our work, and now it's being very careful about giving supplemental oxygen when it's not indicated. Like without a doubt, O2 is life-saving. If somebody's hypoxic, you have to provide oxygen. But in the hospital, often, if you just walk into the hospital with like a sprained ankle, you might get a face mask oxygen at some hospitals, even though you're not hypoxic. And so, um, you know, and as long as you don't have real mito disease, you're probably okay. You can basically consume up that O2. Um, but there have been studies now, really rigorous studies, meta-analyses, uh, even a prospective study that was actually halted early uh, that came out of ICUs in Italy that basically evaluated either liberal oxygen therapy, so an O2 sat of 98 to 100%, or a conservative O2 therapy. And you can see the survival curves over here. The ones that received the more conservative O2 fared better in the ICU. So this has nothing to do with myo disease. This has to do with just you know, how much oxygen you're giving folks in, in ICUs. And so I think this may be related to things like uh, you know, when you get like a uh, ST segment elevation MI, for example, if you get a PTCA, the question is, should you give more oxygen or not? Our work would actually suggest that we need to be careful about giving too much oxygen, especially when you're not hypoxic. So thank you for the question. Hi, thank you so much for the great talk. I was just wondering if you measured any oxidative stress markers or also the redox balance, especially when it comes to the diseases that the related to mitochondria, because I, I'm better than all OGs, but I think that the mitochondria, when, when it's deficient of, of the electron transport chain, it's like a nuclear reactor with, with bad operation. So you, you give more fuel there, and it will create more catastrophe. With the hypoxia case, you're just tuning down the, the material to, to process, and it becomes performing well. Or, or am I totally wrong? No, I mean, I think it's it's very, very natural to think it may be traditional ROS. Now, when folks have, you know, looked for markers in these particular models, they're not exactly uh, teaming up with a lot of ROS markers. And also uh, for Friedrich's ataxia, Friedrich's ataxia has failed 10 different trials of extremely strong antioxidants as well. And so, again, I'm invoking dioxygen, not, not superoxide, not H2O2, but dioxygen, as the toxic substance. And so the model, again, is broken respiratory chain. We're not consuming oxygen, so it's accumulating. And that high oxygen, there's lots of enzymes 
that will use it as a substrate and, and maybe you don't want that. And so we believe that in the same way that a lot of enzymes have evolved to operate at temperature optima, Similarly, a lot of enzymes have probably evolved to operate at sort of oxygen optima as well. And so if the mitochondria is not sucking the oxygen out, there's going to be high venous hyperoxia, and certain enzymes are going to be O2 labile. And we've identified some of those O2 labile enzymes in our screens, and so we think that's what the nature of the pathology is. So it's, it's a different way of thinking about oxygen toxicity. It's not the traditional way, I think. Okay, I think we're gonna, yeah, very, very, very quick, okay. Thank you for the nice presentation. Just wondering if you think that dioxygen this compound is the accumulation which is producing the, the problem. Then what happened with metformin, for example? If you inhibit the complex one, then you will also see increase in this uh, accumulation. So yeah. I, I would also agree with uh, my colleague here that probably is more that you reduce uh, the metabolic rate and then you reduce the electron transport chain and then you accumulate more or less uh, redox, uh, ROS. No? Yeah. yeah, no, look, I mean, I think uh, this is going to be a very, very pleiotropic mechanism because, I mean, oxygen is probably the third most widely used sort of substrate in all of metabolism. I think after water and protons, you get oxygen. So, it's so it, in the same way that l temperature, right, impacts many, many reactions, oxygen does also. I'm telling you what our model sort of supports right now. There may be more traditional ROS effects as well. Metformin is, is, is a fascinating uh, problem. We can, have, we, we can have beers for the rest of the year talking about how metformin acts. Uh, and you know, I, I do think that there, there's an entire response, whether it's the AMP kinase pathway or whether it's the integrated stress response. There's a lot of uh, hormesis uh, uh, mechanisms that may be at play. Uh, metformin may be inducing uh, stress responses that are then net beneficial. But we should talk offline about metformin because that's a totally separate uh, and complicated uh, problem. Okay, so with this, thank you very much again. That was a beautiful talk and a fascinating discovery. Thank you very much.